you'd like to read with me, the scripture reading today is going to come from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason, also the people went and met him, because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about John chapter 11, and we noticed something that was different about John chapter 11, the story of the Lazarus coming back to dead, uh, coming back to life from the dead. That would be bad to come back to dead. Uh, coming back to life from the dead. And so as a result of that, we made a point that it's interesting that John is different from the other Gospels because it includes some stories like that one that none of the other Gospel writers give. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also sometimes find similarities as opposed to differences. And the story that we're talking about this morning is going to be one of those similarities. From John chapter 12 and verses 12 through 19, we're going to take a look at that moment in time when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, basically kicking off the final week of his life before he would ultimately be crucified. This is something that is interesting for us to point out because out of all of the chapters in John, we're just barely halfway through John and now we're going to immediately start focusing a lot of attention and John will give a lot of attention to things and details that the other gospel writers do not concerning that last week and the time subsequent to that time uh, in the life of Christ. But this morning what I want us to do is I want us to examine eight verses of scripture. Eight verses of scripture that will focus on the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem that's found for us in John chapter 12 verses 12 through 19. John chapter 12 verses 12 through 19. And I'm going to want you to notice something that as much information as Matthew, Mark, and Luke record about this event, John records the least amount of information. But we're going to also include four more verses of Scripture in this passage of study that will help us to perhaps learn some lessons for our lives that maybe we did not as we study this before. So let's take a look at John chapter 12 and let's begin in verse 12 where we read, On the next day the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, then something happens. We're going to see that occurrence in verses 13, 14, and 15. And then as far as his official entry into Jerusalem on that great day, that's all that John says. But what I want us to do this morning is I want us to ask this question. What did the crowd do? What happens after verse 12? What are they preparing to do with Jesus' arrival? Well, here's the answer to that question. They recognize Jesus as the king. They recognized him as the, king, as the king. Now, I don't know that they knew all that that meant. I'm sure that they were looking for an earthly king over a spiritual king. I'm sure they were looking for an earthly kingdom over a spiritual kingdom. I'm sure they were looking for an earthly military force as opposed to the spiritual forces of God. But they did recognize Jesus as a king. And what we're going to do is we're going to go and do something that I, I don't do very often, but I'm going to take us back to October 22nd, 2017, nearly three and a half years ago, when I preached a sermon from the book of Matthew entitled the exact same thing. 
You might remember we were in the middle of our nearly two and a half year study of the Gospel of Matthew. And we were approaching that time on that date. And we took a look from Matthew's account, which is much more inclusive regarding facts and details than is John's account. We took a look at, on that day at four signs that showed Jesus was the king. Now, interestingly enough, John records three of those. And I want us to take a look at that, but I also want us to make sure that just to understand everything completely, I want us to look at the fourth indicator as well that demonstrated that the cr crowd recognized Jesus as someone truly unique and someone truly special. The first sign that showed Jesus was king we find in verse 13. And this deals with the branches on which Jesus entered. You might notice in verse 13, the first part of verse 13, we see that the crowd of people took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. Now that's all that John mentions about this. If you were to read Matthew 21 and verse 8, you would find that the, most of the crowd and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. Now, we might wonder why they were doing that, but... If I were to use a modern term, you would understand it completely. What does it mean when we talk about rolling out the red carpet for someone? Well, we realize that someone special has arrived, someone very unique, maybe somebody powerful, maybe somebody rich, maybe somebody worthy of great respect has arrived, and so we roll out the red carpet for them. If you've even seen in, in movies or depictions of a king or a queen coming into town, I've seen it where they'll take rose petals and cast them on the ground ahead of the coming royalty. This is exactly what is taking place here. They recognize Jesus as both a prophet, as some gospel writers will record, and king. Somebody who is not only speaking God's will to the people, but someone who is God's chosen messenger, and in this case, royalty himself. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 reads, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches, were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, John records for us this heavenly depiction demonstrating that even in his heavenly vision, God the Father on the throne, the Lamb of God, our King, they are being honored as royalty. And amongst the ways that they are being honored by this heavenly host, this spiritual vision that is trying to uh, be translated somehow to John's human mind and our understanding, the, this heavenly host is using palm branches in much the same way as many of the people in Jerusalem were using palm branches to honor, honor the entering king. A second sign that showed Jesus was the king was the shouts to which Jesus entered. In verse 13, we see the very same thing mentioned. And we see that the crowd begins to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, that phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is a direct quote from Psalm chapter 118, verses 25 and 26 where the psalmist wrote, O Lord, do save. We beseech you, O Lord. We beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The psalmist is recording the wishes of the people who are, that are being expressed on this day of Jesus' entry. Not only do they recognize that Jesus is one who comes in the name of or by the authority of God, but they realize as, a, as an answer to the prayer, this is the one who would not only save them, but send them prosperity. Now again, I imagine that they looked at prosperity through physical, earthly, human eyes rather than through the spiritual abundance that we can be supplied in this life and most certainly in the life to come. But we see them 
quoting this Old Testament passage of Scripture, declaring that the one who would come from God is now there before them. Luke would include something that the other gospel writers do not include in Luke chapter 19 and verse 38. After he records the people declaring, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke then says that the people mention peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, we realize that when Jesus came to the earth, uh, the shepherds were told, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But what's interesting is, these are the people who are declaring peace in heaven. Isn't that interesting? But the peace is the coming fulfillment of what Jesus would deliver to us. The peace that we would have the hope of eternal salvation rather than only the consequences of our sin. We also see the glory that is given to them in the highest. Glory that is given to the Godhead. Glory given to God in the highest because of who is becoming, who is before them, who the Father has sent. Let's take a look at a third sign that showed Jesus was the king, and that is the animal upon which he entered. Now we find this in verses 14 and 15 of John chapter 12. You will see that Jesus finding a donkey uh, fulfills a prophecy that was written, and that prophecy in verse 15 comes right out of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, I have to admit, if you're like I am, you kind of find that strange. Wouldn't it be better for Jesus to come in on some stallion, maybe a white stallion like the Lone Ranger, or maybe a black stallion like the Disney movie, the horse that wins the race in the end, or something bigger, more powerful, more noble? Here we see a donkey, and not even a full-grown donkey. It's the donkey's colt. So that to us in the 21st century, to our Western minds, seems a little strange, but not in biblical times. In biblical times, and in not only the first century, but in the centuries prior to that, people who owned livestock were wealthy. Uh, perhaps they were people of great power or influence. Perhaps they were considered kings or maybe king equivalents. The reason that I say king equivalents is because that's what you've got in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, you do not have kings yet. You have God's people who are appointed to judge over Israel. They were military leaders. They also served as what we would kind of consider a king or a president or somebody who was in power over the nation. But it's interesting, in Judges chapter 5 and verse 10, we see a declaration of those who have, the people who are rich. And the declaration is, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets. It's a description of those who have things in this world. And it's interesting that a donkey is mentioned, and not just any donkey, maybe one that was white or one that was pure. Once again, I go back to the, the Lone Ranger and silver, that great white stallion that was that was pure white and we remember uh, and I realize I wasn't alive at this time but I've still seen the black and whites even in the black and whites uh, silver was that white stallion uh, of our hero and so this is interesting this shows a donkey but it shows a white donkey demonstrating not only power and influence but purity as well in Judges chapter 10 verses 3 and 4 we read about one of the judges Jer and after him, we read, Jer the Gileadite arose and judged Israel 20 years. Verse 4 reads, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. Now, once again, my Western mind, my 21st century mind sits there and thinks, evidently they couldn't afford horses. But that's not how they viewed it. And we've got to retrain our brain to think just exactly how they would have seen that. In Judges chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, we read about another judge by the name of Abdon. And we read that Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, judged Israel after him. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. So once again, not a sign of poverty or something that is less, but actually considered by them a great honor and certainly a status of privilege or position. So Jesus coming in on that animal, that particular animal, demonstrated to the people 
that he was someone special. Now let's take a look at the fourth sign that showed Jesus was the king, and that's the garments on which he entered. Now you'll notice out to the right of that statement, I've got three question marks because John does not record what the other gospel writers do. But again, if we would go back to Matthew chapter 21, verses 6 through 8, we're going to see two pieces of material, two garments, or at least in two instances, that are laid before and under Jesus. In Matthew 21, beginning in verse 6, the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. First and foremost, they're providing that not only as a saddle, but they're doing that out of their own self-sacrifice. So they are giving their own garments to put under Jesus for him to sit on. But even more than that, we read, most of the crowd, verse 8, spread their coats on the road. Now, once again, we might sit there and think, well, I don't want to take my coat off and put it on the road. First of all, the road's dirty, and, and that'll get my coat dirty. And secondly, I sure don't want some animal walking on it, no telling what's going to happen there. That was not the mentality that was going through these people's minds. Their mentality was this person who is entering is so special that not only are the branches going to honor him as he, he and his animal journey across them, but they were willing to take off their own garments and lay them down to literally signify the speciality of this king. The book of Second Kings, chapter 9 and verse 13 reads, And they hurried, and each one took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. In other words, they were not going to allow the king to be treated like everybody else. They were going to treat him with great respect and awe. It wasn't too long ago, just a few weeks ago, that we were talking about this in one of our Bible classes, but it is an interesting point that when the scribes over the centuries before the time of the printing press would make copies of the Bible, they would do so with great care one page at a time, making sure that not only every word was accounted for, but every letter of every word was counted to make sure they didn't miss anything. And one of the great things about God and the name of God and how they revered the name of God was how they would write it. They would never write God's name at the end of a page because they felt that God's name was too great to be considered the last word to be mentioned on any given page. But what I like even more so is they were not willing to put his name first on the page either. And you might think, well, that sounds a little inconsistent with the reasoning we just gave for them not putting it at the last page. But that's because writing, no doubt, with a quill and ink, they would dip that, ink, that quill in ink before writing a new page. And because the name of God was so special, they would not put his name first for fear that the fresh ink would smear. And therefore, they would dishonor the name of God. I want you to consider for just a moment how much the people in this moment, the people who are going to later shout, crucify him, crucify him. I want you to consider how they treated him as he entered into this last week before his crucifixion. They treated him as a king. Now, if you want to take a look at some of the other information that we included in that lesson I want to encourage you to go back to that lesson I mentioned to you that we preached on out of the book of Matthew but we've still got a few more verses to cover and there's more to this more that some of the other gospel writers do not include themselves and that's in the remaining four verses we're going to begin by taking a look at John chapter 12 and verse 16 and we're going to notice four points in these last four verses that perhaps can be good application for us today. Because in light of the king's entrance into that city of Jerusalem, there were some reactions from differing parties that are present on that day. And the first reaction comes as regard to the understanding of the disciples. Perhaps I might say the lack of understanding on the part of the disciples. In verse 16, we read these things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done, that they had done these things to him. 
We sometimes are a little critical of the disciples. I think we are especially critical of Peter. We're critical of the disciples when we don't realize that we often behave just like them. We're critical of Peter when we especially don't realize that we behave just like him. And I want to remind you that Peter was the one who had the faith that actually wanted to get out of the boat when perhaps none of us would have said the same. We have to give them credit where credit is due. But at the same time, this is not necessarily a slap in the face to the disciples. This is not saying they weren't paying attention, that they weren't good students, or that Jesus wasn't a good teacher or did not make himself clear. Sometimes he made himself abundantly clear to the disciples, and they still didn't get it. But later on, they would. And that's exactly what happens with us in our learning process we sometimes don't understand something in the beginning, and later on, we have a light bulb moment. This is one of the ongoing challenges of pulpit preaching, like what I'm doing right now. As I look out over this crowd, I see very, very young people here today who are just a few years, maybe even months away from their birth. And on the other hand, I see some of you who are on the other end of the spectrum. I won't say how far off you are, I don't know, but you're, you're getting there, I'm just telling you. In between the young and the old are every type of experience, every type of background, every type of religious understanding, every type of spiritual maturity. It's hard to preach one sermon to all those people and everybody understands. It's not just having to do with age, it is having to do with understanding itself. You take, for instance, the first person who shows up to worship with us for the very first time. Maybe they have no religious background whatsoever, but they're still listening to the same sermon you are. Maybe you've got that person who has been reared in a religious home, but they were reared in a denominational home, meaning they have been taught some things that are not according to the Bible. So they have to actually unlearn things before they can learn things that are true. Imagine that same sermon is being delivered to everyone present. That's why it's hard. It's hard sometimes to present a lesson that can be challenging to the young mind and challenging to the older mind, Challenge, challenging to the one who is immature in faith and challenging to the one who is mature in faith. But realize that after a while, everyone who sticks with it, everyone who sticks to the Word of God, they start to learn things and start to understand, and they start to get things like they never have before. I cannot tell you how many times that somebody has maybe who is brand new to the faith started worshiping with us, and after about six months, they'll make the statement that said, I've learned more in the past six months than I have in my entire lifetime. Well, that's because we want to be good students of the Word of God. And we emphasize that here. We want to open up God's Word and find out what His will is for our lives. Well, the book of Ephesians is not a book of rebuke like the book of Galatians or the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of Ephesians is a very, very basic book written to the church in Ephesus to a body of believers that Paul is kind of reminding and maybe reinforcing some basic fundamental principles. But it's Paul who says in Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 21, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. When I think about the disciples not understanding everything that was going on in that moment but later understanding, I see Paul's relationship with the church at Ephesus. He says to these people who have been baptized into Christ, they have a faith, but their faith is still young. And this is why he's praying. I hope that at some point in time, you have that light bulb moment, that you are enlightened, that you understand things that maybe you understand a little bit now, but maybe it's a very young understanding, a very immature understanding. I hope that you grow in that understanding. I hope you grow in that faith so that it is a solid foundation, a, a mature understanding of God's will for your lives. Raise your hand if you understand everything about God now. Raise your hand if you understand the depth of Jesus' love for you. 
Raise your hand if you understand how God created everything and knows everything. Raise your hand if you understand the, the extent of God's grace and mercy for us. You see, we don't know it all. In this side of heaven, we're not going to know it all, but there's a lot of room to grow. I could ask you how many of you have room to grow, and I would hope that every single hand would go up because we all have room for improvement. We all have things that we don't know at all yet, and some things that we know but we just barely know. We're scratching the surface, and perhaps Paul's prayer would be applicable to us today, that we also be enlightened regarding God's will for our lives. Let's take a look at a second group of people. We find this group of people in John chapter 12 and verse 17. Now, we realize that in this passage of Scripture, the people are referred to simply as people, but we also then see them defined in a greater way. It's not the crowd in general, but it's the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead. It is these people that are testifying to what has happened. They are testifying about Jesus, what he did, his power, over death to give life, they are testifying. Now, I want to point out something, just take a moment to, to segue for just a moment and, and, and make something clear. The religious world often misuses the words testify and witness when they talk about things because nine times out of ten, when the Bible talks about somebody who testifies, it's somebody who has firsthand knowledge. If it talks about a witness, you're talking about what we might call an eyewitness. And so we read about people who are witnesses to the crucifixion of Christ. They were witnesses to the miracles of Jesus. Why? Because they saw them with their own eyes. Sometimes today, people take the noun witness and they turn it into a verb. And they say, let's go out and witness for Christ. Well, I've never seen Christ, not physically, not like the people of the first century. But I see him by faith in the word of God. These people were actually there to witness Lazarus come back from the dead. They witnessed this man who was dead walking and talking moments later. They were witnesses and they went around testifying to what they saw. Now it's interesting. Maybe we cannot testify or be an eyewitness to the resurrection of Lazarus, but I do believe that there is something similar that the Bible calls on us to do. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, John would write, We have seen, remember this is John writing this, a first century character who was a witness to these things. John says, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. In the next verse, he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now that is something most certainly that I can do. In fact, that's something I'm not only called to do but commanded to do. And that is to confess with my, my mouth what I believe in my heart. And it's not just a verbal confession, but it is someone who lives the very confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Whoever does that, the Bible teaches us that God abides in him and he in God. That means when I go around, I want people to know who I am and whose I am. I want my life to be that confession. I want, I want them to see in me God's glory and glorify him as the result. So I can be a person of confession. And I can go around and I can share with others my faith that is founded in the word of God. Let's take a look at John chapter 12 and verse 18. And let's talk about the confirmation of the people. Now, we're not using the word confirmation like some do in the religious world. That would uh, be an incorrect adage. Some religions, when you get to be about 12 or 13 years old, they go through what is called a confirmation process. That's not something that's found in the Bible. But what is found in the Bible and what we see in verse 17, or I'm sorry, in verse 18, 
is this. For this reason also, and talking about Jesus having healed Lazarus, raised him from the dead, for this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. Those who were not eyewitnesses, those who could not give actual testimony as to what Jesus had done, heard what he had done, and they wanted to go find out for themselves if it was true. They wanted to go see, is there really a man by the name of Jesus who is indeed uh, someone sent by God, who indeed has the power of God over death to grant life once again? Is this such a man? Well, if that were the case, if I were living at that time, I would want to go check things out. I would want to go confirm or verify the stories that, I've been, that were being heard. That takes me to a passage in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, that perhaps is relevant to us in this part of our lesson. In Colossians chapter 1, as Paul greets the church at Colossae, he first begins by identifying himself. In verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now listen to what he says next. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you. Just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. Paul says, I've heard things about you. I've heard good things about you. And, and it has been confirmed to me. Obviously, the Apostle Paul had divine inspiration by the Holy Spirit, so this was true. But as Paul would write on several occasions regarding several things, I've heard good things about you. Word spreading about the Christianity you're not only teaching but living. And sometimes that's a good thing. That's a good thing to have a good reputation. It's a good thing to have a good, godly influence on others. And sometimes if we have it just right, some people might have to really confirm or verify it just to see if it's true. I gave the illustration at the early service, uh, the same as I'll give to you right now. Sherry's not here today, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about her in her absence. But Sherry and I knew a young lady several years ago when we lived in another state. And this young lady, after she knew us for about three or four years, she made a confession. Uh, she made the confession that she didn't really believe regarding Sherry that she was real. Now what she meant by that was she just couldn't fathom that anybody was that happy. <laughs> that anybody was that bubbly that anybody was that warm and fuzzy, and that anybody really wanted to hug that many other people. Those of you who know my wife, you know what I'm talking about. She just couldn't fathom that they, she was real, so she figured she must be fake. One of those people who puts on a good face at the church building, one of those people who puts on a good face when they know they're being watched, but maybe it's somebody else differently. She said, after three or four years, she says, I've got to confess, you're real. By the way, she had no comment about me. But concerning Sherry, she says, you're the real deal. You're the real deal. And so it's interesting. What do people see in you? What do, pe what do people heard about you? What have people heard about the Lord's church? Have they heard, as has been our reputation in the past, that if you want to know about the Bible and if you really want to know what God teaches, go ask those Church of Christ people. They know the Bible. They know the Word of God. Is that the reputation we have as a group today? What about individually? What do people see in us? Do they, do they know how we act and react and how it's different from other people? We don't use foul language. We don't dress immodestly. We don't go places we don't need to go unless we're going there to try to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And are we consistent in that effort? Do people know that we're not just fair-weather Christians? As I pointed out in one class this last week, there's a difference between being a child of God and a Christian. 
You see, a child of God, much like the two children in the story of the prodigal son, you can have a child who is faithful and a child who is unfaithful. They're still children of God, but some will enter into that eternal reward and some will be cast out because they've turned their will, turned their lives against the Father. But a Christian, by definition, is someone who is Christ-like. And that means somebody who is faithful. Are we known as a faithful people? And finally, from John chapter 12 and verse 19, we see the confession of the Pharisees. Now, that's not the confession like that young lady made to Sherry. That's not a confession of sins. No, it was an acknowledgment of the facts, and the facts were not going their way that day. In John chapter 12 and verse 19, we read, So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, brethren, make sure you understand that these are the Pharisees talking to themselves. And this is very important. Because when they make that statement to themselves, you see, we're not doing any good. Everybody keeps following this guy, Jesus. It reminds me of the original Rocky movie. If any of y'all have ever seen the Sylvester Stallone movie, the original Rocky, it's about a, a boxer who was completely off the charts. Nobody knew him. He wasn't on anybody's radar. And the world champion, Apollo Creed, was going to give this underdog of underdogs a shot at the title. Now, nobody expected Apollo Creed to lose. Nobody expected Rocky Balboa to win. But when they fought that day, toward the 15th round, even though Rocky had been knocked down time and time again, he kept getting back up. And right there toward the end, as he gets back up on his feet, he looks over at Apollo Creed. He looks over at the world champion, and with his gloves on, he says, come on. It's like he's saying, I'm not done yet. Apollo Creed his shoulders dropped. It's kind of like he took a big sigh. He could not believe what was happening. That's what I think about these Pharisees. This guy was from Nazareth. He's the son of a carpenter. We should have taken care of him a long time ago. We're the Pharisees. We know all this stuff. We're supposed to be top of the, the, the hill here. And yet time and time again, Jesus has defeated them. He's defeated, he's defeated them with the show of his wisdom. He's defeated them with the power of his word. He's defeated them with the might of his miracles. And the bottom line is no matter what they do to try to knock this guy off of what they believe to be his perch, people still leave them to follow him. You can just picture them going, nothing we're doing is doing any good. Everybody keeps following after him. <sighs> you know what? There's a lesson to be learned there as well. If you were to take a look at a Acts chapter 5, verses 14 through 29, you would find a passage of Scripture that's very familiar to most of us. In the early life of the church, Peter and the other apostles were going around, and they were not only preaching and teaching about Jesus Christ, but they were healing a lot of people. We even read in verse 14 that Peter, when he came by, some people were excited over the possibility of healing if his very shadow would fall upon them. The people from cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirit, and they were all being healed. Jesus' legacy continues. And what happens? Now, this same group of people, the religious elite, respond to this as well. The high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. Well, you know the story. During the night, an angel freed them and gave them instructions. Go right back and start teaching again. And that's exactly what they did. When the leaders sent for 
the apostles, the guard couldn't find them. And they came back and reported, they're gone, they're missing. And that's when in verse 25, someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Well, you remember, the high priest questions them once again, says, we gave you strict orders. Don't you know who we are? We're in charge here, not you. We're the ones who are over everything, not your Messiah, not your Lord, not your carpenter, Jesus, who's gone. We're in charge. We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You remember what Peter said? Along with the rest of the apostles, they answered, we must obey God rather than men. You see, that's the kind of confession I want my opponent making about me. The same confession that Jesus' were opponents were making about him. We're not getting anywhere with this fella. His faith is too strong. He's too grounded. He's too immovable, steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, as Paul would tell the church at Corinth. But I can't, I mean, on Sundays... He's just always there with those other Christians worshiping. Uh, when I see him in the workplace and he hits his thumb with a hammer, he just won't curse. Every time we start telling dirty jokes, he walks away. I even saw him at the beach the other day, and he was modest. That's what I want people to say about me. That's what I want their confession to be, that when they see Kevin Patterson, they see somebody different. They see Jesus Christ alive and well and leading his life. It's kind of interesting when Paul would write Titus in Titus chapter 2 verses 6 through 8. He would give us several instructions for Titus the preacher to give to older men and older women and younger women. And in this particular passage, younger men, although it would be applicable to all of us. But he says, likewise urge the young men to be sensible... In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds, sound with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech which is beyond reproach. Now, we see a lot of those lists in the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, here's how you need to live. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And that's what he's just said. Be sensible, be a good example, be pure in your doctrine, be dignified, sound in speech. Oh, by the way, make sure you're so sound in speech it's above reproach. These are things we've heard over and over again. This is not unique, but here's what's interesting. This is why he tells the young men to do this. He says, so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. Hey, there's a good reason why we should do good things, and that's because God said so. But that's not the only reason God gives us. God gives us that admonition to do good things, to live righteously, so that it will be easier on us regarding our opponents, regarding our critics, regarding our enemies. Because our enemies are the same ones as Jesus. And they were always looking for a foothold. They were always looking for a way in. They were always looking for some way to undermine Jesus as the Lord, as the King. They just never could find it. Even Satan, when he tempted him three times in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, Jesus defeated him. He gave his opponent no foothold. That's what he wants for us as well. He wants us to live our lives in such a way as people don't see inconsistencies, but rather they see that devotion, that dedication, and that commitment that we talked about in previous weeks. That's what we want. If, there, if my enemy confesses anything about me, if our common enemy in Christ has anything to say about us, let it be the following confession. We can't Move them an inch. They are diehards. They are strong. They are unwavering in their devotion to this man called Jesus. When our enemies face them, here's what I want their response to be. 
The passage of scripture that we used not only as a basis for a lot, but also the cry that the people made out to Jesus when he entered into Jerusalem is Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And it reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, we are never going to witness Jesus on this earth riding on a donkey. That time is over and done with. What we do know is Jesus is going to make one more triumphal entry, but it'll be in the sky. He's going to come with his angels in flaming fire, raining vengeance upon those who know not God and obey not the gospel. But to those who are faithful, to those who are members of the body of Christ, to those who look at that passage of scripture there and who are rejoicing greatly at the coming of the king, who are shouting in triumph, over the coming of his victory, who behold him before them, not only in the life to come, but in this life here as he leads their paths and shines the light of salvation on them. To those people, they get to meet him in the sky, and then the Bible says, and there forevermore with him we shall be. Jesus is coming again. The question is, do we acknowledge, do we realize, number one, that he is the king, and number two, he's coming to save. But he's going to save those who are his citizens and who obey his commands. So the question for you this morning is real simple. First and foremost, is Jesus Christ the king of your life? Have you put on Jesus in baptism? Have you recognized his greatness? Have you realized that he is, in fact, the Son of God? And if so, have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay your life before him so that he can heal you, so that he can cleanse you and make you one with God. If you are a child of God, ask yourself this question. What kind of influence are you for him? What kind of example are you for him? When other people see you, do they look at you as an opportunity to join in their worldliness? Or do they sigh that big sigh and shrug their shoulders and look down at the ground realizing they've already been beaten before they've begun? That's the, one, that's the kind of influence I want to be. I want to be the kind of person that is so strong for the Lord that not only have I found his pleasure in my life, but I've also found enemies who would rather go on to more fertile ground than with me. That's what we need to be in Christ. We need to rely on him for his help, for his leadership, for his strength, for his love, as he leads us through this life successfully into the life to come. Look forward to the day when he returns and says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. If you have a need to respond this morning to the Lord's invitation, take advantage of this opportunity. Let us know in some way. Hold your hand up. Come to the front. Sit on the front row. Hand us a piece of paper. If there's anything at all that we can do to help you, to pray with you, or strengthen or encourage you, let us know how we can. While together, we stand and sing.